All right, hello, welcome back. Today I'm gonna to be talking about secondary function chords, otherwise known as tonicization, and today I'm gonna to be talking about tonicizing the dominant specifically. Consider this example in G major. Diatonic Roman numeral and contextual analysis reveals to us that we have tonic expanded using linear dominance 542 and 543 uh, before we get to a predominant function and then we have what looks like a chromatic chord and then the dominant function half cadence with the leading tone in the melody which is a super common type of cadential formula there. So let's back up to the penultimate harmony here. There's a chromatic pitch in there. And if we're looking at this as contrapuntalists, we might look at this and say, well, it looks like just kind of passing motion. With D major being the goal, which is exactly the way I think we should think about this harmony as a contrapuntal event. But first, let's look at the chord structure here. We see an accidental, C sharp, and that doesn't necessarily tell us we're in E minor or anything like that, because it's pretty clearly G major that's happening. This is a half cadence at the end here. So then we look at this chord and we can see a familiar shape. C sharp, A, E, G. It looks like a dominant shape chord, a dominant seventh. A, C sharp, E, and G. And we know that dominant seventh chords have a very specialized place in our musical analysis system because of that diminished fifth or augmented fourth of it inverted, that whole relationship of the diminished fifth collapsing inward or the augmented fourth expanding outward. This is what we call the key defining interval. So if we look at this chord, we can see something like, ah, it looks like a dominant seventh chord, a major minor chord. And if we're thinking about this in isolation, these last two chords, well, up in D major, this looks an awful lot like 565. And in fact, this is not that different from that scenario. We're just in a different global key. We're in G major globally. But what we're doing is, while in G major, we're borrowing a chord from D major, which is its dominant, to get to our global dominant of D major. So how can we show this analytically? Well, something as simple as this. We're borrowing 565 five from the key area of 5, D major, and we're applying it to that chord in this G major context. So this is pretty much what we're talking about when we're, when we're saying tonicization. And notice what this ends up doing is something that you probably suspected. That passing motion, or that presumed passing motion, is now just expanding that predominant function until we get to the cadential dominant. So this word tonicization has some familiar stuff to it, tonic in particular. So if we look at what's going on with the tonicization, we're taking some sort of dominant structure chord that is a 5-7 chord, 5 or 5-7 chord, or maybe a leading tone chord, leading tone seventh chord, and we're applying it to or evoking the leading tone of some sort of diatonic chord. So this whole, the rest of this lecture is just about essentially moving toward the dominant chord and how those sorts of things might play out with a number of different examples. So then returning to our example, we can see that this half cadence is a little bit more specialized because it's evoking this dominant chord of itself. So we refer to this as a tonicized half cadence, and I label it as such. So to back up a step, we're talking about dominant family chords. So these chords are going to behave as normative dominant chords behave. So we know linear dominance fairly well. If we're looking at this example or series of examples, none of this could I mean, potentially example one could be cadential, but this all could be cast within a broader sort of context of tonic expansion. For example one, shifting to G minor. For example two, and we know that five, four, three has some possibilities for maybe variance, maybe something like, and five, four, two. But we know that all of these are essentially linear dominant chords. We know that leading tone will go up. We know that chordal sevenths will resolve downward, and that's that key defining interval. T, Do paired with Fa, Mi, or Fa, Me in this case. 
And as in the penultimate example, every now and then, because of the passing tenth motion in the outer voices, we might get a series of uh, sevenths that look like they might not have resolved appropriately. But that's all stuff we already know. And leading tone chords, seventh or not, are similar to dominant chords. Seven six is like five four three. Seven seven, similar to five six five. 765 is like 543 with more constraints. And 743 is like 542. Leading tones still go up, sevenths mostly still go down. So, what harmonies can be tonicized or embellished by a dominant structure chord? Essentially, any chord that is stable can be tonicized. So, what do I mean by stable? Let's look at the major collection. You might notice that most of these Roman numerals are either major or minor. There's only one outlier, which is our diminished seven chord. So all the stable harmonies are either major or minor chords, which makes some sense. If we're thinking about these as key areas, take C major for instance, think about a two chord in C major. We're talking about a D minor chord. D minor is a key. It has a dominant chord, in other words. In other words, therefore, we can use a chord in D minor to make a bigger deal about a two chord in C major. If we consider something like the seven chord, it's unstable, it's diminished. Augmented chords are also unstable. In other words, if we're thinking again in C major, B diminished is not necessarily a key area that I feel comfortable working with and saying that it has a dominant chord that we can evoke here. That's what I mean by stable or unstable and what can be tonicized. You might notice that the minor collection has more variance, it has more dissonance in the chord collection, and it has more possibilities. I only laid out some of the possibilities here. There's quite a few more chordal options here, like a minor four chord, or sorry, a minor five chord, a major four chord, and so on. But these are the most common ones that we come across. And you might notice there's a fair amount of stability still. The subtonic chord is stable, actually. Um, but we also have some chords that are unstable, the two chord, the predominant, or the supertonic, um, a predominant, and that seven diminished triad, again, being unstable. So these are what can be tonicized or not tonicized in major or minor keys. We're just talking about what's stable. Is it a major triad or a minor triad? If it is, it can be emphasized with its own goal-oriented dominant structure. All right, so let's start seeing some of this in action a little bit here. Take this example, one flat, looks like a sharp at the end, C sharp, and we have a few different things we can think about, but this looks like D minor to my eye. If we look at the Roman numeral and contextual analysis, we can see a tonic chord moving through a predominant supertonic chord to a cadential dominant embellished by a 6-4 position. So let's expand that predominant area. This whole entire lecture anyways is about tonicizing the dominant. So we're just gonna look at different ways that the dominant gets approached. So let's expand this area here. So now in measure two, there's a chromatic chord that's intervening between that two chord and the dominant chord. You can still hear the goal as being a dominant chord, a five chord, and it's embellished with six four to five three motion. And then if we look at this G sharp harmony here, we might notice a familiar shape. We have G sharp, E natural, B natural, and D natural. Now that looks like a five six five shape or chord structure borrowed from something like A major. And notice that the next chord is an A major chord, it truly is. It's just embellished with six, four to five, three motion. So this is how five, six, five might act as a secondary dominant chord. We can see it as a passing tone between fa and sol, fa, fi, sol in the bass, which is very common to see. And above it, we have this sort of six, five position with a chordal seventh in the melody, which does a lot of the legwork for us. If we put that chordal seventh, which is a tendency tone in the melody, it kind of writes its own resolution for us. And then we can see it as the ultimate goal of being the dominant chord here. Now, if you thought way back when, when we talked about six, four chords, that a cadential six, four chord, it's like a tonic chord in second inversion. 
Well, chromatic harmony actually teaches us why that tonic chord is not necessarily a tonic chord in second inversion. 565 five doesn't resolve up to a second inversion chord. We have never seen that. What 565 five does is the bass note resolves up by a half step to the root of the next harmony. And we know that 6-4 chords are essentially embellished versions of their 5-3 position structures. This is just to reaffirm something we already know. 565 five is essentially moving toward a root position chord, and that's why this half cadence is, or this tonicized half cadence is all a root position chord, just with that 6-4 to 5-3 motion happening above it. So 565 is really similar to something like 7-7, seven, seven, seen in this example here. Now notice the other accidental that I haven't mentioned, B natural. Why is B natural here? Well, B natural is here because we're talking about dominant shape chord structures. And in order to keep that intervallic structure intact, in minor mode, we need to borrow another accidental to make the chord quality happen. And that's if it's something like a five of or a seven of. If we're tonicizing the dominant in minor mode, you're gonna need phi, and there's gonna be some other accidental that's at play to make that chord shape happen if you're spelling the complete chord anyways. So in this context, and it has to do with the byproduct of, this is all kind of an embellishment of roughly a two chord. Remember that falling fifth idea? Uh, from two to five to one. So if we're going to five and we're falling from a root build off of two, well in minor mode two, the supertonic chord is diminished. So that's why we end up needing to see some sort of uh, chromatic alteration there uh, to account for that disparity that occurs with the chord structure when it's borrowed into the new key signature. So then some other ways we can see tonicization acting toward the dominant is maybe through another series of expansions. Again, tonicizations of five are typically predominant in function. So we can expect them to be kind of analogous to other predominant expansions that we've seen. Take this example, for instance, in A major. So this example has a good old friend of ours in it, a six four chord in the middle of it. We see an A major chord in second inversion. And it's not acting as a cadential chord in this context. It's acting as a passing chord with a voice exchange happening around it. But you might notice that this voice exchange, this voice exchange is chromatic. F sharp and D natural to D sharp and F sharp before resting on the dominant chord. So this is what we call a chromatic voice exchange. But it still does the same thing that we saw regular voice exchanges do. It holds an area intact, in this case the predominant area. So that predominant area is initiated after the tonic, after tonic expansion ends, sorry. We get predominant initiated, passing 6-4 leading to 5-6-5, five, five, and then our traditional dominant at a tonicized half cadence. So passing 6-4 as we've seen, but instead of the 2-6-5 that we might have used before here, we just have 565 five instead using that chromatic voice exchange idea. And all these examples so far have dealt with a half cadence but made it a more specialized tonicized half cadence. But since we're tonicizing the dominant, we can also see just that acting in regular tonic expansion. So if we took out the chromatic chord here, we might notice something like, imagine that first measure is just a dotted half note. It looks like normative 5, 6 to 1 stuff that happens. But we might embellish that 5, 6 motion with a dominant chord that steps down into a first inversion chord. In other words, a 5, 4, 2 chord of the dominant. We know that 5, 4, 2 steps down to a first inversion chord. And if we're borrowing a dominant, we're in E major. So if we're borrowing a dominant from the dominant, Okay, so the dominant of E major is B major. And if we're looking at B major and choosing a dominant chord, well, it's a chord that has A sharp in it. F sharp, A sharp, C sharp, and E in this context. So this is one way we can see this sort of chord structure playing out in another sort of context here. 
So it can be functioning as a tonic expansion here, in this case as an embedded phrase model, or it can be cadential as we saw in the previous sorts of uh, examples in this exercise. So to review tonicization in general, we're talking about applied dominance from a key, borrowing a key's dominant, and therefore evoking its leading tone. And tonicization can only be done to stable harmonies. We're talking about major chords or minor chords. And specifically, if we're tonicizing the dominant, we can see that the applied chord functioning as part of the predominant in a cadential formula, that falling fifth that goes from some sort of predominant to dominant to tonic chord. And then we can also see that secondary chord um, expanding tonic, like in the last example, because we know that tonic expansion can involve a lot of just one and five motion. Therefore, we can expect tonicizations of five to be a part of that as well.